Let's start this way. What is going on with the birds? Have you seen this? I, I, I know much more interesting content is sprawled across the news media, but, but this one caught my attention. In nine states over the last three weeks, thousands of birds have been found just dead. And not just, not just any birds, songbirds. Now, they, I had them cut these out for me. These are actual news clippings, and you can Google them. Just Google sick or dying songbirds and hit the news tab. Uh, one, the first one says researchers are trying to figure out what's causing mysterious bird deaths. The second one, songbirds are mysteriously dying across the eastern U.S. Scientists are scrambling to find out why. Songbirds are dying across several U.S. states, and we still don't know why. In Indiana, the state has 92 counties. In 69 of those 92 counties, they have found hundreds of thousands of dead songbirds. Washington, D.C., Connecticut, all through the U.S., just hundreds of thousands of dead songbirds. Now, when I saw the report, it was bothersome strange. It's more bothersome that they don't know what's doing it. It's not as if we don't have enough stuff going on in our air right now. And this thought started to fester in my soul. The, the sky is losing its song. The sky has been a lot more quiet lately. Now, I have no idea what's killing the birds, the song birds, but I do believe there is a spiritual parallel. As I begin to meditate and pray over this, the Lord began to speak to me that the church isn't singing like she used to. Reasons for, well, maybe it's the trouble the threats, the turmoil, or seasons of pain, problems, and of course, the pandemic. But for whatever reason, we're not singing as much as we used to. The Old Testament church, the children of Israel, went through this. Psalms 137, verses 1 through 4, talk about it. That there was a time when Israel went into such a difficult season during the Babylonian captivity that the psalmist writes that they hung their harps by the willow trees and they wept when they remembered Zion. It goes on to say that they were asked to sing the Lord's song by their captors and they responded, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? There's something about strange times in a strange land that if you're not careful, it'll kill your song. You know, any song will die unless you sing it. And the song in you can die unless you sing it. But they said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I don't know if you've noticed it lately, but America is a strange land. Pandemic that's lasted almost two years now with various waves and variants attached to it. Shutdowns, lockdowns, we're free one day, locked back down the next, then we're free again. There is political divisiveness that has reached an all-time high. Such such hatred in politics between one side toward the other and the other side toward them that friends are being torn apart. Families are being torn apart. Even churches are being torn apart by a political divide. It's a strange land. 
We've seen economic unrest. We're all in the span of not even two years. We've had a bull market and a bear market. We've had an economic recession and an economic boom all at the same time. Nobody knows what to do. Nobody knows whether to step out and invest, launch something, or hold back and be conservative. It's just a strange time in a strange land. If you, if you want to know how strange it is out there, go get on an airplane. We were on an airplane last week, and they were, they were telling us across the loudspeaker that there's been so much frustration and stress and uh, just volatile behavior from passengers that if, if we were in any way disruptive or unruly, that they would duct tape us to our seat like they did that other guy a couple of weeks ago. And I think the guy was halfway kidding when he said it on the speaker. But just, just the concept and the conjuring of the memory of the news report that we duct tape somebody to their seat on a plane just made me realize these, these are strange times that we're living in. And it's a strange land. The evil scourge of racism being splashed across our screens with news report after news report and video cell phone footage of, of the hate pouring out of people. So it's just a strange time in a strange land and and maybe we've done what Israel did maybe we've encountered strange times in a strange land and threw our harps away and decided to stop singing our song and maybe the problem is a missing motivation now real quick there's only three motivations for singing praise to God Number one, knowledge. Number two, faith. And number three, trust. Those are the only three motivations. And when you sing, you should be singing out of these three motivations. Knowledge says, I sing because of what I know about God. I sing because I know God can do anything. You understand knowledge is formed by the combination of information and experience. So because of the information that I have learned about God and the practical experience I have about God, I know God can help me in my future because I know God has helped me in the past. And based off of that knowledge, I will sing. An old song the church used to sing, they used to say, you can't make me doubt him. I know too much knowledge. I know too much about him. So knowledge says, I know that God can do anything. Faith says, I believe God will do something. Good. It hasn't happened yet, but I have faith in something that I haven't seen. It hasn't manifested in my life yet. But I have faith and I have confidence in something that has yet to appear. And so because I have faith, I will sing. Knowledge says I believe he can do anything. Faith says I believe he will do something. And those are two powerful motivations to sing from. But they are not the most powerful. The most powerful is number three, which is trust. Because knowledge says, I believe God can do anything. Faith says, I believe God will do something. But trust says, even if God doesn't do what I'm praying and hoping and believing for him to do, if God doesn't do anything, I'm still going to sing because I trust him and because he is God. Now, trust, trust is powerful because trust says, um, God, you don't have to validate your worthiness by your performance. <laughs> you don't have to prove yourself again in order to get praise out of me. I'm going to praise you because I trust you. I'm, I'm going to praise you when I don't like what I'm seeing because I trust you. I'm going to praise you when the prayer goes unanswered because I trust you. I'm going to praise you at times when my heart is broken and the situation didn't turn out like I hoped it would because I, I trust you. And trust is, 
It's powerful because if you've got a song motivated by trust, it's the only motivation that can never be taken. It can never be shaken and it can never be moved. When you're praising God based off of knowledge, your praise is limited because knowledge is limited. You don't know everything. And if you live long enough, you will go through some seasons where you look around and you don't know by knowledge what is going on. And when you find yourself confused and your knowledge fails you, if you're not careful, it'll steal your song. And, and, and singing by faith is powerful, but there will be times when your faith becomes frustrated because sometimes God makes you wait in faith. And if you're not careful while you're standing in faith, waiting on that mountain to move, you'll press pause on your song until you get the manifestation of what you were believing for. Oh, but if you sing by trust, there's never a circumstance, there's never an issue, there's never an enemy, there's never a situation that can come and steal the song out of your mouth. Because I'm not singing to see you move, God, and I'm not singing to see you turn something around. I'm singing just because I trust in your character that you are who you say you are. I'm singing by trust. Push somebody and say, do you trust him? Sometimes God will allow your knowledge to fail you and your faith to be frustrated, to put you to the test and see if you really love him or you just love the things that he's able to do. It's a Job season we go through sometimes where everything that the Lord blessed you with seems like it begins to dry up and all the things in your life that used to make you smile are now making you grieve and cry. Sometimes God wants to know, can you stand in that type of a season and still lift your head up to heaven and lift your hand in praise and open your mouth and sing a song born out of a trusting relationship, a song born out of, I still trust you, a song like my grandpa sang the day we told him his 19-year-old grandson had been killed in a rollover accident. Most faithful man I know who's ever walked with God. Most consistent, clean, squeaky, clean man. When they gave him this news and with a breaking heart, he wept and he said, God, I don't understand you, but I trust you. And my broken heart, Grandpa, started to sing. 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 Sing, sing. Our text in Isaiah 54, 1 is a strange one. It's oxymoronic in nature. Does it make natural sense? For the text says, sing, O barren. Now, our culture, in America today limits our understanding and our ability to perceive this text properly. Because in America today, huh, prophylactics, let's say it like that, prophylactics, family planning, even surgeries to prevent pregnancy are a multi-billion dollar a year industry because our society more and more increasingly is seeing getting pregnant as inconvenient. So from a cultural standpoint, we read the text and it's difficult for us to grasp the absolute desperation that a barren woman faced in biblical times. Consider with me, ladies, that history has not always been kind to women. Societies have not always been kind to women. And in biblical antiquity, it was very difficult to be a woman. Women couldn't vote. They couldn't occupy uh, seats in government or in office for the most part, a queen here or there, but 
But really, other than that, by and large, the society was not kind to women. They viewed women as second-class citizens. But a barren woman, a woman that couldn't produce, was totally ostracized and seen as an outcast. So there was an intense desire from every woman to get pregnant. And when a woman got pregnant, she wasn't trying to hide it, you know. She, she was celebrating. Walking into the room all extra. You see this? You know? Excited about it. It was a badge of honor, and this idea was so prevalent that when a woman couldn't get pregnant, they would start praying reckless and and strange prayers like Rachel when she laid on the altar and she said, God, give me a child lest I die. Desperation. And desperation is powerful. We could use a good dose of desperation in the church today. People don't come to church desperate anymore. They don't act desperate anymore. They don't praise desperate anymore. And I've been praying that God would give us a group of people that are not satisfied just to come to church, but never produce anything out of their spiritual womb. That it's not enough to come in and sing and shout and get the word. I want to leave with something down on the inside of me that I can push out of my spirit and into my life. I want the manifestation of the promises of God and the fruit of the spirit. I want to be productive and I'm desperate for it. But the problem is desperate people make complacent people nervous. If you praised like a desperate man or a desperate woman, it would annoy everybody in your section. If you prayed like a desperate man or a desperate woman, the church security would start looking at you funny. If you really came to God desperate for something, it might change other people's opinion of you. So we've created a culture that pushes out desperate people. And they did in Bible days, too, the Bible tells us of a desperate woman named Hannah. And the scripture said she came to the temple year by year. Say that with me, year by year. And every year she prayed desperate prayers. The only thing the Bible tells us about Hannah throughout those years is that all she would do when she would come to church is pray and weep in her desperation. Pray and weep. She never sang a song. She never preached a message. She never prophesied. All she would do is pray and weep year after year offering the same request to God. God, please open my womb and give me a child. And she was so desperate, one day she prayed so hard and wept so bitterly that the priest thought she was drunk. The Bible says she got up off the altar staggering. Nobody remembers this. Just pause for a minute. I remember when we used to have prayer meetings where people would pray till they literally staggered to their car. I remember we used to have services and praise God with such intensity that we had to help other people to their car after the service. But the desperation and the passion and the faith to push with that much intensity is like falling out of the sky. It's almost like it's dead. But, but Hannah got up and it was such a shock to the priest he hadn't seen desperation like that in church in so long he said woman how long are you going to be drunk put away wine from you she said she said pastor I ain't been drinking in the church she said I'm a desperate woman pouring out my bitterness toward God and asking him to open my womb and he releases a prophetic word and he says as you have asked so shall it be to you and, and, Hannah, and Hannah makes a deal with God. She said, I don't know if I trust that backslidden preacher or not. Because, you know, sometimes you get a word and you kind of look at the preacher like, ah, ah, ah. she said, God, I tell you what, if you'll do what he said, if you'll do 
what he just prophesied. If you'll make that real, I don't know if it was real coming from him or not, but if you'll make that real, if you'll open my womb and give me a child, I'll give him back to you. I'll dedicate him to the house of God and he won't grow up under my roof. He'll grow up under here. He'll light the candles. He'll change the incense. He'll serve the church. He'll sweep the church. He'll clean the church. He'll tend to the church. I'll give you a servant for your house if you'll just open my womb with a child. And God heard her prayer and opened her womb. And the Bible said when she gave birth to that baby, she named him Samuel, which means God has heard. And when God opened her womb and gave her that baby, the Bible said she started to sing. She started to sing. Now, now a lot of people sing in Scripture, but it's rare for the Scripture to record the lyrics of their songs. But Hannah sang this song so much that they recorded the lyrics to it in the Bible. You want to know why? Everywhere she went, she sang it. Every time she introduced somebody to the baby she was holding, she sang the song. Look at the miracle God gave me. Look at the blessing God gave me. Everywhere she went, she would sing. She knew she had been blessed, and she could not keep silent. She had the wisdom to know that when God blesses you with something that would not have happened any other way you owe him a praise that when God has been good to you and opened up doors that no man could open the very least you can do is open up your mouth and sing a song of thanksgiving praise glory and honor to God and and, and it's an amazing thing Hannah's song it's beautiful lyrics it's taught in theology it's a marvelous it's a marvelous it's a marvelous thing. Standing there with full arms. Looking down at a beautiful smile that she thought was impossible. Standing there saying, God, I thank you with this song. For removing the reproach of my barrenness. God, I want to sing to you. Because you took that step stigma off of me. God, I want to glorify you. And it's a and it's a beautiful song, but it don't go in my text. Because Isaiah 54 1 doesn't tell people who just received their miracle to sing. It doesn't tell people that have full arms and grateful hearts because they've received the thing that they asked for. It doesn't tell them to sing. Isaiah 54, 1 says, sing, O barren. In other words, God said, I want to hear the song not of full arms. I want to hear a song from empty arms. I don't want to hear a song from full hearts. I want to hear a song from broken hearts and broken dreams and barren bank accounts. Four kids sharing one bedroom don't know how you're going to pay the rent. I want to hear the song of somebody whose car just got repossessed. I want to hear the song of somebody who's got to find a new place to live and you don't know where to look. I want to hear the song of somebody whose marriage is miserable and whose children are in trouble. I want to hear the song of somebody that's got a circumstance that no matter what you do, that thing will not change. God is not asking the fool to sing. God is asking the barren to sing. The people who have not yet received what they're praying for. The people whose prayers have not been answered. The people who are standing in the middle of a situation so frustrating, it doesn't look like that thing's ever going to change. God said, I want to hear the song of the barren. I want the barren. I want the barren to sing. I'm sick of hearing the songs that were only motivated by my performance. You got a new car? 
so you sang me a song. I healed your marriage, so you sang me a song. I healed your children. I touched your body, so you sang me a song. And that's all well and good in the knowledge and the faith stage. But I wonder if the barren have the courage and the trust. I wonder if people in barren, dry seasons have the tenacity and the force of will. I wonder if I've touched your soul in a way that just the knowledge of my presence and my existence is enough to motivate a song out of you and I I've been noticing your tears and I've been I've been hearing your prayers and I've been noticing your frustration but one thing I hadn't heard yet from the Baron I hadn't heard you with a song and and what I'd like to hear is I would like to hear the Baron start to sing which is what the writer meant in Psalm 96 one, when he said, sing unto the Lord, oh, I feel like preaching, a new song, sing unto the Lord, a new song. He wasn't saying, write some new lyrics and get you a new tune. He was saying, I know you've been singing because you've been blessed. And I know you've been singing because you got a raise. And I know you've been singing because God dealt with your enemies. And I know you've been singing because God forgave all your sins. I know you've been singing because God's been good to you and given you what you want. But anybody can sing when they get what they want. He said, God wants to hear a new kind of song. He wants a song from somebody stuck in the middle of depression. He wants a song from somebody who's losing their mind in anxiety. He wants a song from somebody who just buried a loved one. He wants a song from somebody that's addicted to drugs and alcohol. He wants the song of somebody that doesn't know how they're going to make it to next week. He wants a new I wish I could get somebody to praise him. I wish I could motivate somebody to praise him. You don't realize how much God wants to hear your voice. You don't realize how much God wants to hear your song. You don't realize how much God wants to hear your hallelujah. Push three people and say sing, 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 sing. Going through hell, but I'm going to sing anyway. Don't have the money I need, I'm going to sing anyway. Children going crazy, I'm going to sing anyway. Sick in my body, I'm going to sing anyway. Enemies threatening me, I'm going to sing. Sing, sing. Sing, sing. Sing, sing. Sing, oh barren. Sing, oh barren circumstances. Sing, oh barren investments. Sing, oh barren bank accounts. Sing, oh barren job. Sing! Sing, sing. Sing, sing. Sing, sing. Sing! Right where you are. Right where you're sitting. Right where you're standing. Right where you're watching. I dare you to throw your head back. Open up your mouth and make a sound to heaven and sing. Somebody say yes. Yes. Yes, yes. 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 I'm confused, but I'm going to sing. I'm in pain, but I'm going to sing. Going through hell, but I'm going to sing. Marriage in trouble, but I'm going to sing. Don't know where the next thing's coming from, but I do know that God is God alone. He's high and lifted up, and though he slay me, I said, though he slay, I don't know who I'm preaching to, I said, though he slay me, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still, I'm still, I wish I had a church in here. I still Is there a praiser in the room? Is there a barren praiser? A broken praiser? Is there anybody in the room that hadn't let your song die? Oh yeah! Sing! Sing! You forgot who you are. See, you threw your.
your harp away. Sing. Go get your harp. Go get your soul. Sing, O oh barren. Sing, O oh disappointed. Sing, O oh disenfranchised. Sing. Said, I've grown weary with the songs of blessed people. I've grown weary with the sound of the songs that come out of people's mouth when I've given them everything they want because you lose something when God gives you everything you want. You lose a tone in your voice when all your dreams come true. You lose something more valuable. The higher you go, the more you lose. The richer you get, the more you lose. The more influential and successful you get, the more you lose. And, and every now and then, God's ear starts to ache. And, and he longs to hear the sound of a broken person's praise. He longs to hear the song of a weeping heart's praise. He longs to hear the song of a desperate Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I feel the glory of the Lord rising in the room. Sing, oh barren. Ah, hallelujah. Sing, oh barren. Ah, try it out on your neighbor. Say, sing, oh barren. Oh, you got to say it like a preacher. Say, sing, oh barren. Yeah, sing, oh barren, you. Oh, hallelujah, who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. I ain't going to that church on Walsham no more. Because the truth of the matter is, every time I go, it's just been way too. I understand. I understand. But when you have demons of depression fighting you all week, and, and when the enemy's trying to get your kids hooked on drugs, and and when the devil's after your marriage and when they found cancer in your body like they did Dorinda's, you'll come to church desperate and you won't mind making a little bit of noise. You won't mind crying a lie. I wish I could get 10 seconds aloud. 10 seconds aloud. I don't know where you are in this church. I don't know what you need from the Lord, but I wish I had about 10 seconds aloud. 10 seconds of crazy. 10 seconds of desperate. 10 seconds of wild. Where the wild at? Where the wild? Wild. Crazy. Desperate. On the edge! Sing, O oh Barrett! Sing, O oh Barrett! Sing, O oh Barrett! Sing, O oh Barrett! Sing till you feel it break! Sing till you feel pushed over! Sing till the presence comes! Sing! I don't know what you're waiting for. You came for a word, you just got one. Get you some space, open up your mouth and sing. Sing, 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 sing. The power in your voice, power in your confession, power in your praise, power in your heartbreak, power in your soul ache. Power, 
children of the desolate that means that the desolate actually have the capacity to produce more than the people walking around talking about how blessed they are more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman number two the strangest thing happened he started saying, I'm sick of the people that got full arms and everything they want. I'm sick of them uh, singing. For a minute, I'd like to hear the sound of broken people, barren people. People ain't got nothing going on. People that ain't seen change. People that ain't seen breakthrough. I'd like to hear a song from them. So they started singing. And God said, verse 2, enlarge the place of your tent. Oh my God. God, that's not why I was singing. I was singing just because I tried. I know, shut up. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Next verse. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Verse 3. For you shall expand to the right and to the left. Don't he know it's just me in this tent? All the single people listen to me. Don't, don't he know? It's just me in this tent. And yet he says, you got to do a remodel project. You got you to gotta enlarge the place because you're going to expand to the right and to the left. Why? Because your praise out of a barren place has invited me to come where you are. Oh, Jesus, your praise from a barren place has invited me to come where you are. And where you are right now is too small to contain me. So enlarge the place where you're at. Lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, because I'm going to come visit the barren praise. There's another scripture that says God inhabits. He comes down in the praises of his people. That means when the barren start praising him. When the barren have the courage not to let their song die. When the barren can maintain a hold on what it means to sing to God out of a place of trust. God himself will come down and take your praise and put his presence in the place where you are. And as a result, put the verse back up, please. 
as a result of the visitation of his presence, he said, and your descendants. No, let, let, let's not just shout it. Let's think about it. What descendants? He started the text saying, oh, Baron ain't got no descendants. But he said, after I make a visitation to where you are, <laughs> I'm going to leave you with something inside of you that will never allow you to be barren again and your descendants. Do you know there's a praise you can give God that blesses your kids? He told this barren woman, I'm going to bless your descendants. Because of the song you sing to me out of a hard place. Now, I know I'm talking to plenty of people going through a hard place this morning. And the last thing, I'll be honest with you, I know I've lived through it. The last thing you feel like doing when you wake up in a hard place Last thing you feel like doing is singing. In fact, if you try to sing a song in a hard place, it's almost like you have to climb through layer after layer of resistance. I don't know how many real worshipers I got in the room, but, but those times where you've tried to offer a song to heaven, but, but things are so, so hurtful and painful in your life, it's, it's so hard to even get it out and get in the flow and get in the, the move in the river of worship. Because it's a hard place. It's a dry place. It's a, it's a barren place. But the text is telling me that's exactly when I should sing. That's exactly the perfect set of circumstances to give God the sound of the song he really wants. To to sing unto the Lord a new song. When you get new pain that you've never had before, sing a new song. When you get new disappointment that you've never faced before, sing a new song. When you get new financial trouble, That there is no relief in sight. It provides you a place to sing to the Lord a new song. And wherever you're hurting, however complex it may be, God sent me by to tell you the answer is sing. Sing, 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 sing till your soul cohabitates with heaven. Sing until the presence of God invades your space. Sing until the angels of the Lord, which, which excel in strength and hearken unto the sound of the voice of the word of the Lord in your mouth. Sing until you're not singing by yourself. Sing. Until the Holy Spirit begins to roll within you, sing, 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 sing. Stand to your feet. Give the Lord a praise all over, all over. Father, I pray that the heart and intention and seed of this word would be planted and sealed in the spirits of your people. Oh God, you know what they needed and where they needed it. I pray the Holy Spirit carries the precious seed beyond the veil of the mind and the intellect that can debate, that can pick apart, that can be affected by cultural style and carry it deep into the womb of the Spirit where true change, true manifestation, and true power 
can be seen in the name of Jesus. If the word blessed you, give God a praise all over the house. Come on, give him one more praise all over the house. Come on, all over the house. Oh, yes. You better play those drums, boy. Yeah. Come on, one more shout out of your spirit. One more praise unto God. One more hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Listen, the final thing he says in verse 4, he says, do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. You can remain standing. Do not fear, you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced. You will not be put to shame. You will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of it anymore. Listen to me. The last Listen, shh, the last thing God told me to tell you, when you sing out of a barren place, point number four, God will give you a new beginning. I prophesy over your finances over your family, over your vocation, over your mental health, over your marriage, over your children, over your current circumstance, I prophesy a new beginning in the name of Jesus. Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing now it shall spring forth a new beginning, a new beginning, a new beginning. God spoke that to me at 2.30 this morning in my study. The last time I had looked up at my, at my clock on my computer, my clock has the date, and it was, it was 11.57, and it was 8, August 8, 7, and, and then I... I looked up at 2.30 and God said it's a new beginning. Tell them from verse 4, I'm going to take away the shame and take away the reproach and, and I'm going to give them a new beginning. And I looked at the clock and I looked at the date beside it and the numbers were 8.8. Eight. Eight. Today is 8.8. Eight. Eight. And if you don't know, 8 in the Bible is the number of new beginnings. I prophesy in concert with the date, in concert with Isaiah 54, 4, and in concert with the Spirit of the Lord in my belly, that a new beginning is coming to your life. Today it starts. Now it starts in the name of Jesus. When you get home, you're going to start to see it. As you go through your week, you'll start to see it. Your month and the rest of this year, you're going to start to see it in that situation, in that circumstance. God is sending a new beginning. Give him praise for it. Give him praise for it. Hallelujah. 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 I feel that thing in my Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Listen, I want to invite you to do what our leaders already did in our, in our early morning meeting. I told them I wanted to be the first to do it, and me and my wife were. 
If this is for you, if it's not, don't worry about it. But this is for you, this new beginning thing, this 8-8 eight, eight thing. I want you to get an $88 seed and bring it to the altar all over the building. People started coming up because they felt the impulse to give. And that's the appropriate impulse when you get a prophetic word. If that word was for you, I want you to get an $88 seed or as close as you can get to it and bring that thing up to the altar. If you're giving on your phone, come up to the altar anyway. Slap the altar and go back to your seat. But there's a seed in this house that will get heaven's attention. There's a seed in this house that'll break a cycle. There's a seed in this house that marks your day, that draws a line in the sand, that's a line of demarcation, that's an emblem of your progressive movement in God. It is a new beginning. Watching me online, get involved in this. You can sow your seed right now. You can click the link in the comments and partner with us during this time of sacrificial giving to God. But, 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 in the scope of things, just in the overall scope of things, it's, it's a small thing. It, it's a light thing. It, it's, it's just like what David said in Psalm 96. If you go there with me, Psalm 96, just one more scripture. Psalm 96. Let's see what verse. Psalm 96. Let's see. What verse? Oh, verse 8. Give to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. That's what we're doing right now. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness and tremble before him all. I prophesy a new beginning over your life over your children. Your children are about to start a new beginning. The new beginning of a new school year. I prophesy a new beginning over them in the name of Jesus. In fact, all of our kingdom kids come down here and get in the altar. And if you're in the room and you're, you're under or you're in uh, school at any grade, come down here. I want to pray for you. If you're in high school, wherever you are, come. Come get close. Come get close. Come get close. We're going to pray for them. Hallelujah. 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 Come get close. Come get close. I want our elders to come. We're going to get all around them. We're going to get all around them. Come on, give our kids a big hand. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 Come on, y'all get in close. Father, in the name of Jesus, we speak your blessing. We speak your protection. We speak your influence. We speak that you would mark them as your own. We speak, Lord, your grace, your mercy, your strength. We speak, Lord, your favor and your blessing. We speak, Lord, your guidance and supernatural wisdom. Lord, we thank you for protection. We thank you for great strength and confidence. Lord, we thank you for blessing in the uprising and the down setting. Lord, we thank you for giving supernatural creativity and the ability to absorb knowledge. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Let everything that's been going wrong in your body physically be healed from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. I speak to your brain, to your central nervous system, to all of those things that have been causing those seizures, and we speak an end to it in the name of Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus over you from the top of your head to the sole of your feet. I want to remind the enemy that healing is the children's bread, and God, this is one of ours. This is one of your children, and we speak healing into her body right now in the name of Jesus. We curse the spirit of sickness and we say divine health will be your portion and favor will be your portion. I wish I had a pray in church. Why are you standing there? These are our kids. Let's pray. Can we pray for a minute? Bless Lord now in the name of Jesus. Bless and strengthen in the name of Jesus. Help me Pastor Coker. Bless and strengthen in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Bless this one Lord in Jesus name. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. In the name of Jesus. Bless and strengthen Lord. Cover shield, guard, and guide. Bless, Father. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you Lord, for calling her your own and revealing who she is in you. Thank you, Lord, for removing the darkness that she's had to face. Thank you, Lord, for comforting her and holding her. Thank you, Lord, God, for blessing and strengthening
hallelujah, I will sing. Oh, Lord, I will sing. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord. your hands we speak as a congregation as a leadership team we speak and release the blessing of the Lord over each and every one of you we call you great we say you will be mighty in the earth you will be signs and wonders that the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty amen give our kids a big hand as they go back to their seats we love y'all may the lord your god bless you may the lord your god keep you may he lift his countenance upon you and give you peace may you go in the radiant light of his word and his counsel and may you always remember no matter what state you find yourself in sing 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 <laughs>